So welcome to this conversation uh, among the greeting UPF members about the exodus from Ukraine. Uh, as the, the migration group that we are, a uh, migration research group, we will focus on the, the dimension related to human uh, movement and in, in terms of an exodus, right, that's going on from, from the war in Ukraine. And specifically, some of the key questions that we will approach are how do we build a research agenda that is refugee centric and focused on the voices and experiences of the most marginalized? How can we analyze the European answer, both at political and at the social level? What are the implications for the treatment of migration and refugee issues in the near future? And how do we navigate the pressures of conducting academic research with the moral obligations to help in a humanitarian crisis? These are some of the overarching general questions that we approach, but then each of, of our speakers will uh, focus on a specific question that is close to his or her uh, area of research. So I, I will first uh, leave the floor to Lorenzo Gabrielli, who's going to talk about the decrypting the representations of Ukrainian refugees and their impact in the bordering process. Uh, please okay. welcome Lorenzo. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm sharing my screen. Okay, um, let me start with uh, my intervention about the visual representation of refugees, of Ukrainian refugees. Uh, first of all, to I will start, I would like to start explaining what is not my intervention. It's not about a, a reflection about the Russian invasion and the war. Um, it is about Europe uh, and this is not uh, an analysis of international relation of geopolitics, at least not in its uh, very conventional way. And uh, is not a normative standing on the, the invasion and the conflict. It's just a very preliminary to about the power of images in framing and defining collective perception and behaviors, in this case, the European perception about Ukrainian invasion and the arrival of Ukrainian, Ukrainian refugees. My starting question is the following one. Why this very quick and quantitatively important arrival of Ukrainian refugees in Europe. We are talking about more than 5 million refugees in a couple of months, just at the doors of Europe, has been perceived politically and socially and managed uh, by states and the European Union so differently if we compare to previous inflows of asylum seekers and refugees. I'm referring to Syrians, to Af Afghans, Iraqis, Malians, etc. Uh, in this frame, why this difference? Um, my focus is about what role images and visual narratives plays in, it plays, play in this dynamic and uh, what, they, what role they, they play in framing the current policy answer of European Union, European countries toward Ukrainian refugees. Uh, I think that in, in this conflict in which the power of images seems to be even more central than in previous one, uh, just thinking about the images of all the European leaders, in this case, Van der Linden and Borrell visiting uh, the Ukrainian president, uh, but all the European and Western leaders visiting Ukrainian to take photos and, and chatting with the Ukrainian president to show support. Uh, so images are central in all conflicts, but in this conflict, I have the impression that, that are, that's retransmitted in, in real time in social media and in conventional media. So the images are more powerful than, than ever in probably in history. Images are also central in my view, but it's not the center of my intervention, but I think it's important to mention it, uh, are central in uh, kind of romanticization of war, uh, including the recruitment of civilians, women and even uh, young people uh, side by side uh, clearly with these lethal and destructive effects. But let's see which what the images tell us about refugees, um, which type of images we receive from media. Uh, what is uh, important to consider and was this was shocking for me if compared to previous uh, inflows of refugees in Europe is the fact that most of the images we receive from media uh, showing little group of people with visible faces, even in the case of minors, 
uh, and it's shocking for me because images are not covering even the faces of minor. I do it myself here in, in, in this presentation. Um, so uh, we see that little group uh, visible face we know from from previous analysis on of images of refugees and social psychology that the fact that um, uh, if images portray a little group or individual with recognizable face is more easy to create an empathy um, towards the public and not a, a feeling of insecurity so i think it's a very important uh, is a very important features. No, most of the, the, the visual uh, narrative that we receive is going in this direction, little groups of people uh, with recognizable face, generally well-dressed uh, with a sweep case, uh, kind of similar images that we can see maybe, it's not the same, but similar to what we can see in an airport, for example. Uh, seems to be quite ordered um, flows of people, there's not a large inflows of people in, in a very um, chaotic way. It seems everything is flowing very, um, very well and very well managed. Uh, and it's very, it's very different from previous, from previous period. This depending probably also for, from policies applied uh, at the border at this time, but also uh, images are very uh, selective uh, capability in framing our perception on this reality. Uh, it's shocking also because there is almost no circulation of images representing large group or overcrowded facilities. However, with 5 million refugees in a couple of months, it's sure that there are some gatherings of large groups of people, camps, etc, etc, etc. The very few images that I found in the larger groups um, are coming uh, paradoxically from outside Europe. This is from Israeli media showing a camp and a larger group of people and another one about uh, um, reception facility in Poland as coming from US media. Uh, don't telling that they are, these images are not circulating but that the hegemonic representation is framing little groups uh, of people. And in particular, I think there are, in my view, five preliminary um, axes of analysis or hypotheses for, to, to analyze these images. The first one is the gender uh, issues. And as clearly represented by this declaration of the right-wing populist and xenophobic um, politician, Italian politician Matteo Salvini that say very clearly that while from Ukraine only women and children arrive to Italy uh, from boats arriving in the south and the Mediterranean disembark only adult men. They say, okay, uh, without entering in, in the, the political discussion of this, this tweet, but it's clearly uh, evident that um, most of the, the people arriving, the, the, Syrian, the Ukrainian refugees arriving now are women, children and old person considering that men over 80s are not allowed to exit from the country as they have compulsory to join military forces. Uh, so in this sense, there is a difference. There are mainly women and children. So this frame, this frame a different perception, but there is also a class uh, issue. Uh, so mm, images generally are framing, uh, let's say, a kind of middle class uh, refugees uh escaping with a sweet case uh more or less well dressed considering the situation and i think there is also kind of a matter of uh, selective visibility of some specific border and particularly the polish one where people uh, arriving from kiev and other city and lesser visibility of other border crossings uh, where people coming from rural regions as well as the case of Moldova where for example more Roma people are also fleeing and that will produce a different uh, visual representation so there is a class bias in images that accompany the, the gender uh, bias but there is also race issue as I was mentioning the case of Roma people for example um, Ukrainian are uh, perceived as a white Europeans. So this racialized feature of, of whiteness, I think, is still more in depth European conscience. Uh, what would happen if refugees were Roma people uh, and, and not, uh, let's say, 
um, white uh, population, uh, our perception will be different. Uh, there is another issue that's related to this and this, the religious one, Ukrainian are Christian Orthodox, uh, and this is not clearly visible, but what is visible is the fact that they are not Muslim. And I think this uh, religious bias also playing a huge role in uh, defining uh, collective perception about, um, about um, Ukrainian refugee. And the, the last point is about uh, a geopolitical uh, issue in the sense that the relation of images with political main political actors, states, international relation and geopolitics, I think in, and that's my personal perception, but in a very oversimplified and normative, normatively polarized rhetoric in which there is a bad and the good side, um, and in which European uh, countries are supporting so dogmatically a very specific narrative, sending weapons, no time to search peace, in the words of Borrell, for example, and forcing, in the words of, of UK, some UK officers, forcing the Putin downfall, requires supporting the deservingness of Ukrainian refugees. So in this sense and this possible interpretation, openness toward Ukrainian refugees will be a collateral effect to serve other interest, but is another possible interpretation. To conclude, uh, some very, very, very preliminary conclusion because it's just a preliminary talk, so just an exercise. I think that uh, once again, border appear as a very effective prism to, to deconstruct gender, class, race, religious stereotype and bias that are working and are crossing European society and European policy in the field of migration and border. Uh, there is, in my view, an hegemonic perspective toward the deservingness of Ukrainian refugees, uh, or, or at least of the need to provide them with temporary protection, that chokes with the diffuse perception of undeservingness of previous um, inflows of, of uh, refugees and asylum seekers, and it's the case of this um, visual um, of, of Mediterranean um, that's in Italian, but is, is comparing and is contraposing the, the case of Ukrainian and, and other refugees that arrived previously at the European borders. Uh, so images seems to, to play a key role in my preliminary talk in the, defining this hegemonic perception. Uh, and in this sense, I think it's also interesting to turn the question the other way around. So we can inquire how much visual representation plays in framing the reject of refugees and asylum seekers from other region of the planet before the Ukrainian arrivals and afterwards. And to conclude, I think there are several unanswered complementary questions that, that are important to at least to consider that's the fact of what what is the, the political economy of media so which type of dynamics of production reproduction and circulation of images are playing at uh, this time in in the media company and the, through professional of information and, and and photo reporters for example and are in which way this political economy of media is uh, visibilize a specific narrative and invisibilize an alternative narrative. And I think with this, I will conclude my intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo, for that quite <laughs> interesting, I would like to say also in a way, disturbing presentation, no? but of course I think it makes us have to confront our own reactions to this war and how we react to other wars and other groups of refugees across the world, no, as you say, as Europeans. No? Uh, and uh, what you say about the, the racialized dimension also in, in the treatment of refugees seems very difficult to deny, no, even if you would like to. Uh, which does, of course, not mean that Ukrainians would be any less deserving of all the, all the help that they can get, but that others are as well, no, so. How can we deal with that? Uh, I would like to ask you, I think also just for the format of this session that maybe it's a good idea if we leave a few minutes only for reactions immediately after the presentations. And then if we have some time left at the end, we can also have a, a discussion, a more general discussion. That's okay, because I, I would just like to ask you in relation to your presentation, if you think that there is any chance 
uh, that the, that the, the way European populations, majority populations now now react to this disaster, you know, we, maybe we can feel what the war re really is in a way that we haven't done before, you know, also because it's in an age of digital media, we can follow constantly images that we would prefer not to see, you know, and, and what that does to us. Do you think that it could be any kind of by effect that would lead to more solidarity towards other groups of refugees as well as a reaction? Uh, it's a good question. I, I honestly, I don't know. I hope so, but uh, I think we have to consider also the, the media dynamics and the, the threshold of attention of the public towards a specific topic. I mean, we know that there's, there's, there's threshold of attention can, can follow two, three, four weeks and then is fading uh, and, and other topic will, will rise on the, the, the main media. So I don't know until which point, and then we probably have to see, I think we still have to see what will happen with Ukrainian refugee in, in, in a short term and what how our perception will change. Now, for example, there are information that, that, that uh, Roma, uh, Ukrainian Roman refugees have been forced to leave Czech Republic in order to move to Germany because they were persecuted there. But until which point European society will still accept uh, um, accept and 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 uh, in, in accept the this this the servingness until which point no i don't know honestly it's, i think it's important point to to take in consideration in the next months and and to compare also with the, the future arrivals the future inflows of of refugees from other part of the planet mm -hmm. not very optimistic in this sense but let's hope i'm wrong I would, if I don't, I don't think also there is much reason for optimism, perhaps no. But maybe this could be used also as a case by social organizations, for instance, saying that look how we treated Ukrainians. How can you now defend not opening the doors to this and that group? No, so that's, that's that would be yeah, <laughs> if tentatively optimistic mm -hmm. view on it. But yeah, any other anyone else who wants to? Yeah, John. John, please raise your hand. One question. I, I wonder how much um, how much the absence of images of large crowds at the border mm -hmm. reflects the media's decision making or, or editorial decision making, and how much it ref simply reflects what border authorities and reception authorities are doing, um, particularly since we know that border authorities are, are very good at creating this image of, of chaos and spectacle when they want to. And that the image and that the media, when those images exist, tend to go for them because they sell. Um, so I'm curious if, if you or anyone else has, has seen a lot on on the different sort of differences and basically how the border crossings are working in order to avoid those. That's very, very interesting uh, comments. I think is a combination of both, as as you suggest. No? Uh, the 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 management of the arrivals has been very different from previous time. I just remember the arrivals of of some hundreds of people in some ports in, in Canary Island or in Ceuta Melilla uh, or in Lampedusa or in Lesbos so with overcrowd uh, spaces uh, that's clear that uh, is this possibility to take this photo media taking this photo another fact is about the, the political economy of media and if this photo circulated or if alternative narratives will circulated or not and this is, this is more complex investigation that probably more uh, uh, media specialist will be able to do and not and that's not my case uh, but for sure I think that two the two level are interacting so there's less possibility to to have easily these images of overcrowded spaces so there is also less less uh, lower production of this kind of images and less less circulation of these images I suppose there are overcrowded space there are reception facility but probably journalists are not so interested in going there and take this kind of photo when they can have other typology of photo but as sure as another part is, is happening inside the, the 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 media company and the decision they are made in, in terms of of visual narratives but in, in this, in this uh, I'm not exactly an expert, so it will be interesting to hear some, some other voices in order to complement this, this reflection. But for sure, there is an interaction between the two levels. Thank you. Let's take one more comment. We have Ivan raised your hand. Yeah. Yes, very quickly. I, I think that we shouldn't completely exclude the third uh, 
a possibility. I mean, you both in some way somehow have uh, addressed this issue of perceptions as the media or the border authorities as perception makers. And I think uh, certainly for the media that we shouldn't exclude that they simply reflect actually the uh, widespread opinion of uh, public opinion in Europe. I mean, that the images follow the public opinion and not create them. Uh, uh, I, I, I wouldn't exclude that either. Hmm? I, I think we tend to, to give too much power to the media and, uh, and to the political economy of the media and ignore that uh, they often simply reflect uh, the prevailing opinion in, in societies in, for good and for bad. Uh, I think it's an interesting point in media studies. There are a lot of debates about the, those, uh, those um, agenda setting and the role of media in, in setting the agenda. Who is setting effect, effectively the agenda, political actors, the media, or the, the, the interest of the public, let's say, the market. Um, it's a good point. There are a lot of debates. Personally, I'm more uh, on, on the side that media and political actor have a dominant way, but can be also that's about yes. that's about the market is a part of the game because media uh, survive selling um, selling um, uh, publicity so they they have to search the the market that's sure that there's a, this drives a media uh, to a tendency in in framing normally news and, and information about migration border crossing in a very spectacular terms that was not the case this time that from for this was surprising for me and it was also surprising because tendentially after the just before the arrival of ukrainian refugees we cannot see that the public opinion in europe was supposedly very open towards refugees so why this sudden change uh, is is really so so the media are so uh, sensible to capture the sudden change in public opinion or is just that they, I mean, they are yes, framing. It's complex for sure. Yes, one sentence. It is very complex. I don't have myself a clear view. I, I don't want to exclude this dimension too. But don't forget that already in 2000, here in Spain, we had this discussion whether we should better attract Polish and, and Romanian women to uh, uh, pick the cherries in Huelva instead of Moroccan ones. And this was not determined by media. This was determined by political interests at the time and by uh, 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 well, political interest mainly. So I, I, I think that uh, we shouldn't exclude this dimension, that's all. Absolutely. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you very much. We need to move forward for however, how interesting this discussion ever is to continue. We will uh, continue after the next speaker, with, who is Carmen Geha. Uh, it's going to talk about universities as actors for inclusion and protection of refugees. So. Uh, Please. Good afternoon. Thank you, Zina. Hello, everybody. I just migrated to Barcelona from Beirut, and this is why the house is empty. I hope to be seeing all of you today uh, soon. Um, and I'm here to talk about um, how we can prepare both as faculty and as students to be teaching and doing research uh, with an ongoing refugee crisis. And um, you will see with time when we talk that a lot of what I'll say today um, meshes together, binds activism, research, and pedagogy at the same time. My work has always been embedded in a specific context, um, whether in my PhD I worked on the Arab Spring in Libya, all the way to the Beirut port explosion. Um, I know what it's like, uh, I'm not Ukrainian, I hope next time we'll have Ukrainians speak on behalf of their own experience, uh, and I'm not an expert on this, but I know what it's like to have the ground shake under one's feet. And this has compelled us at the university in Beirut to open the doors of the university to a community in distress and let the community in distress into the classroom. And I'm, I think that uh, there's already a conversation both at UPF and many universities across Spain of how we can welcome and be inclusive of students and of a community in, in distress. I come from a very different place. Lebanon is not a signatory to the Geneva Convention. Uh, the Lebanese state is a failed state run by militia and warlords. Uh, and we have the highest uh, refugee population per capita in the world. 
UNHCR is barely doing its job to address the Syrian refugee crisis, succumbing instead to the will of a subservient state. For example, UNHCR stopped registering newborns in 2015. And the Syrian refugee crisis, as you know, is the largest since World War II. And I say all of this not to compare. I knew, and if I say anything wrong, you would be patient with me. But just to say that experiencing this and being at the university, we decided that we can and should do something about this. Um, so we did. We had a like a four refugees uh, working research group, and that was aimed at collecting all of the knowledge and evidence and research that was done, whether it is on nutrition, maternal health, all the way to employment and refugees, so that we could help destigmatize um, the host communities' images and tension. Um, it's been 10 years, 11 years since the Syrians began, began to arrive in Lebanon. I know that there is a sense in Europe, at least this is what I picked up, that the Ukrainians will return soon. And I sincerely hope so. And it's very painful to see another crisis unfold. However, in the event that they don't return, universities need to plan uh, for long term for because people, when they move, they, they seek home. And for different reasons, uh, we know, I think, from research on migration, that few do return. And so I think we need to start thinking about this. The other thing we did um, is that in 2019, uh, we participated uh, in an uprising. Um, as a university, we shut down the campus and we said that the streets have become the classroom and the classroom has turned to the street. We marched side by side with refugees in Lebanon um, at the risk of backlash from government and other political parties to say that this was a Lebanese uprising, but this had to be an intersectional fight and refugees that are not recognized uh, by the government as refugee status means they can't work or own became part of our cause and we marched together. Um, we also in 2019 launched a center, it's the Center for Inclusive Business and Leadership. Um, and the center works on bringing in the business and the private sector and employers to the conversations around developing inclusive policies. And so over the years, in the last three years, I have we have been working across the MENA region in 13 countries, but I'll talk to you about migrants in Yemen, and Iraq who left their country and became high skilled migrants in Europe who are working with us and in the center to contribute to change back home. So you might think of migrants as also having the capacity to move away but continue supporting uh, root problems at home. Um, I was the founding director four years ago of a program designed to bring Afghan women to Lebanon. It was called Education for Leadership in Crisis. Uh, and I smile because the assumption in 2018 was Afghanistan is in crisis. Let's fund these young women to come to AUB to study, to take a break and then return home. Now they are forced migrants, these students, and they're like my younger sisters. They cannot work, they cannot return because they cannot work under Taliban rule. And so I want to draw your attention that the university can and should factor in issues related to mental health and disruption of people's lives, of students that might find themselves staying longer or lesser than they uh, had ever imagined. After the Beirut port explosion, um, the underserved refugee communities uh, suffering were exacerbated because they were already doing, you know, living under terrible circumstances. And so we launched out of the campus uh, something called Khadid Beirut, the Shake Up, which was a network of faculty and experts and students that wanted to develop inclusive policies and model how schools and hospitals and businesses can open their doors to refugee communities and locals because we had protested together and suffered at the hand of the same regime. Um, um, so I want to draw the attention here of migrants also, I've seen them as political activists in a good sense, uh, who rushed to the site of the explosion and who worked side, side by side with the Lebanese in order to try to rebuild as best we can. Of course, I know UPM and Gritim do this a lot, but there's also a role for the university um, in developing policies when there is a political opportunity. I know in Europe, it's very different than where I come from, policymakers actually listen. Um, but even in Lebanon, we worked uh, tirelessly to develop a network um, on forced displacement to help combat what was at the time the threat of repatriation of Syrians. So we protested, we advocated, we held public panels to say that some people simply cannot return. 
And that, in fact, is the title of my second book, which is very slowly coming together, Those Who Cannot Return. What happened to people's lives who really cannot physically return um, or are too scared to return? Um, uh, I, the last thing I want to add is that universities and schools can operate as borderland spaces where teachers and, and students can work together to foster a sense of identity and civic pride, even for non-nationals. And in our research with Syrian refugee uh, students that we conducted uh, two years ago, we even see this in the worst of places, of campuses becoming a place where people can practice and bring with them, not only be hosted, and I think this is something that Spanish institutions would be uh, very well uh, positioned to do. So just to conclude, universities can mobilize through knowledge production, of course, um, commentary, public advocacy, um, and also um, by, by you know, providing evidence of inclusion and trying to combat stigma. Um, I don't like this idea of crisis as an opportunity because I don't think the suffering of the Ukrainian people or any people should be an opportunity, but crisis is a moment of heightened possibility for change. So why not have the university document the better treatment of a refugee population and then maybe we can learn from it as a, as a global community. Just last thing, universities are about classrooms and students. We can't give uh, we need to give refugee students the opportunity to speak about their journeys, which doesn't end, in fact, when they arrive, when they migrate. Their journey and challenges and suffering can only be beginning. So I think we can open up the classroom to this community of uh, Ukrainians arriving in Barcelona and bring some of their voices uh, into the classroom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carmen, for those uh, reflections from coming from somebody who, who also knows probably more than any of the rest of us know how it is like to, to experience this kind of situation so in, in real life. And the very important reflections that you share on the role of universities, what we can do and what we should do. You know? And we may need to all to expand our idea of what a university is and can be you know, in this kind of situations. I don't know if any of you have any examples, maybe uh, uh, from the UPF, if you know anything that is going on in this area. I know that at Griffin we had two refugee students from Syria a couple of years ago, but they are not here anymore. And I, I, I have to say that I don't uh, have all the knowledge about how UPF works with this issue and if there are any programs now being prepared to facilitate the reception of Ukrainian scholars, for instance, or students. I don't know if anybody else wants to intervene. Okay. Uh, okay, I think that we will then proceed with the next speaker, uh, who is Ivan Martin. Uh, we'll talk about what will be the economic consequences of this new exodus for Europe and the impact on the European labor markets. So a different angle now on the on the current crisis. Absolutely, from perceptions and how they are embedded in images to solidarity and what uh, we as uh, academics and uh, 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 university uh, community can do to what the economic consequences and the labor market consequences of this exodus uh, can be. I will uh, structure my presentation in two parts, uh, two short parts, of course. The first one on the economic consequences and what this can imply for the policy of European countries to third uh, uh, country migrants not coming from Ukraine. And secondly, on the impact on the labor market. On the first one, I mean, it is already clear and we certainly know already that uh, the war in Ukraine is having a, a, a major impact on economic prospects uh, for the whole world. Uh, we have increasing evidence, I won't review it. If, if you want, we can, we can uh, detail it later, uh, of a reduction of growth, very clear, uh, increasing infla infla inflation, and as a consequence, the uh, risk, uh, increasing risk of uh, stagflation coming back to uh, uh, the uh, 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 world economic uh, outlook, what was uh, 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 not the case for uh, more than 40 years now, a part of a country like uh, uh, Japan. 
and uh, uh, the probability of uh, economic crisis is becoming more and more important. And this is affecting not only Europe, but it is affecting also, uh, in particular, Africa and uh, other developing countries worldwide. I think that this increased uh, uh, probability of an economic crisis and the effects that we are already feeling uh, in the living conditions, in real wages, in prices, in growth prospects, very soon probably unemployment too, has uh, two major uh, implications. It is certainly going to increase migration pressures from third countries uh, uh, in non-oil spotting countries in Africa, in North Africa and elsewhere are probably going to feel uh, 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 increased uh, uh, migration pressures and, and this is going to translate in uh, uh, increased number of people trying to arrive to uh, Europe and elsewhere, also of course to the, the United States for instance. And uh, uh, secondly, the economic crisis are typically the moments in which societies take a harder stance on migration. So I wouldn't be surprised that actually, unlike what you have said before, that uh, this could be a window of opportunity for expanding or extending a more uh, humane, uh, uh, more uh, humanitarian uh, uh, treatment to third country refugees. I wouldn't be surprised that this is exactly the contrary. And actually the attitude of public opinions and public policies towards uh, 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 migrants coming from uh, Africa, from North Africa and elsewhere uh, will be hardened. And actually the policy that we have seen, uh, Lorenzo, you have worked a lot on, you are working a lot on externalization policies and others are actually strengthened rather than uh, 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 replaced by more uh, humanitarian approaches. This is my, my first element uh, for reflection only because we don't have time for more. On the second uh, uh, part of my presentation, I, I, I want to reflect on the implications for EU labor uh, market in particular and the growth prospects as well. I mean, we are talking about uh, 5.2 million uh, refugees. This is twice the population of refugees we had in Europe before the Ukrainian war. There were 2.6 million refugees in Europe. And now, right now today, we have more than 7 million refugees in Europe. This is huge in, 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 in every uh, uh, respect. 86%, the uh, figures from yesterday, 86% of those uh, uh, refugees today are women and children, basically 50% women, 36% uh, 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 children under 18. And uh, this means, uh, 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 a very, uh, 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 I would say, unbalanced composition of uh, the uh, refugee uh, flow so far, and like uh, for the cri uh, former crisis. And this has an immediate consequence, of course, is the cost of uh, uh, assisting all this uh, 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 flow of refugees. It is very interesting to see how the first uh, uh, experts to dare to propose a, a, a figure where a non-European uh, think tank, the Center for Global Development, they spoke about 30 billion euros to uh, uh, assist uh, the refugees already in March. Then the European Commission uh, a, a couple of weeks ago spoke about 50 billion euros already and calculations by a think tank in, in Brussels, Bruegel, uh, extrapolating the cost of uh, assisting refugees, Syrian refugees in Germany in 2016, they have come to the conclusion that every million of uh, 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 refugees can cost up to 10 billion euros per year. This would make today 50 billion euros per year, where it's becoming a quite sizable uh, uh, cost. And, and this has many implications. I won't uh, delve on that now, but. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention it. To counterbalance this cost, however, there are a number of positive effects of the arrival of uh, uh, the uh, 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 Ukrainian refugees to Europe. The first one is demographic. I'm not a demographer, but uh, 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 basically so far in only uh, 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 the two months of the war, uh, 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 we have received more than 1.8 million children which is around half of the number of people uh, uh, of uh, children being born 
every year in the whole European Union. So this is a major injection of young population to the European Union population. And to the extent that they are going to be, and they are already being uh, integrated into the education, it is not uh, 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 too risky uh, to uh, uh, assume that many of them will stay. We don't know how many, but many of them will stay. So uh, first positive uh, 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 effect, the demographic boom. In terms of uh, uh, labor markets, uh, we, we are receiving uh, 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 basically 3.3 million uh, women uh, uh, through with uh, children uh, 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 to care in, in many cases. But uh, there are three, no, two elements which are very important. Of course, the first priority is to work, to work to uh, 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 face the needs of their uh, current situation and to send back uh, money to Ukraine for uh, uh, solidarity purposes to the families, to the husbands, uh, to the uh, 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 fathers and, and children who have stayed there. And uh, Ukrainian migrants have a long tradition uh, of working precisely in the sectors, low qualified sectors of the European uh, uh, societies and economies where there is labor shortage. Care, uh, agriculture to a certain extent, uh, of course, domestic service as well. So, and they are already uh, finding jobs and starting to, to, to work. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, they are going to integrate into the labor market very quickly, much more quickly that uh, this has been the case for former flows of refugees for different uh, uh, regions. Uh, and this, of course, has a very positive impact into the uh, uh, European economies, into the growth prospects. And the question is, at which point, the, what will be the turning point between this huge cost of assisting refugees in terms of education integration, in terms of humanitarian assistance, even in terms of support to their integration, social and, and economic integration, to which point these costs are going to be offset by uh, the longer term benefits obtained by uh, uh, the labor market integration for the time being of those uh, 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 one point, uh, sorry, 3.3 uh, million uh, women. Uh, the answer of course depends very much on what we don't know. We are still in the midst of the crisis. We don't know how long it is going to take. We don't know how many more migrants are going or, or refugees are going to uh, uh, leave uh, uh, Ukraine. I have seen uh, uh, today the last uh, publications by the uh, High Commissioner for Refugees of the UN. Uh, they already talk about 8.3 million uh, 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 as prediction. And they put it like that predicted 8.3 million. So we are actually burning all former presidents so quickly in terms of numbers. And we don't know either what is the, going to be the situation of uh, Ukraine after the war and whether we will assist to another many million uh, uh, flow of uh, male refugees, which uh, uh, cannot be excluded either. So we have more unknown than known uh, than certainties, but uh, 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 for the time being, uh, uh, and I will stop there, I think one, it is not sure in any case that the very uh, open uh, welcome to uh, Ukrainian refugees is going to be replicated in any way with other groups of refugees or migrants coming from other parts of the world. Second, the, uh, well, to the contrary, the economic crisis, which is to a certain extent or to a big extent uh, 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 has been made more probable because of the war in Ukraine uh, uh, may actually uh, 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 go exactly in the opposite direction of hardening the uh, stance towards uh, migrants from third countries uh, in the uh, uh, coming, maybe not months, but certainly years. And third, uh, the uh, uh, arrival of those refugees actually is a very uh, uh, good news for uh, the European labor market and uh, for the European uh, population. And uh, in the longer term, they, uh, we are all going to benefit in Europe, I mean, to benefit from uh, that. But it all, all depends, of course, 
on uh, the uh, uh, developments in the near in the coming months in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricard. Uh, no, Ricard, Ivan, sorry. <laughs> Ivan. I don't know how to Ricard take that. Was <laughs> Thanks for that uh, intervention. Lots of implications. There are lots of follow up questions to ask you know, from different angles. And uh, I, I, I don't know where to start. So I would first like to ask if somebody else uh, want to intervene with a, a question for Ivan. Yes, Lorenzo. Yeah, um, thank you, Ivan, for your intervention. I have a question that's very, I, I know it's very difficult to, to, to try to forecast what will be happen, but I'm thinking about uh, which, which pattern of integration of Ukrainian refugees in, in European labor market will the European countries follow. I don't know if you have information about class composition of refugees, the, I, I, probably very easy, but the class composition, the disqualification, and uh, I think something important would be the, the eventual recognition of the, um, the titles of study and, and qualification, defining which type of integration in the labor market will be applied, and I'm thinking about the possible consequences in terms of, of of specific sectors uh, of integration, etc. I know that's very it's very early probably for this question, but I don't know if you have. Some... No, but I, I I think this is a very relevant question, and it is not early to say something. I mean, it is very early to say uh, what is the class composition of uh, refugees. Probably, it reflects widely the Ukrainian society. I mean, it is so massive that probably it is quite uh, representative. But what we do know is what has been the pattern of integration of Ukrainian refugees so far in the countries, uh, uh, Poland, Germany, Italy, Czech Republic, to a lesser extent, Spain as well, where they were already present as migrants. And regardless of their level of qualification, uh, 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 they have basically uh, 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 joined jobs of very low qualification level. I have mentioned agriculture, construction for men, uh, 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 care and uh, domestic service. And I don't think if this has been the pattern uh, in peace times and uh, over the last uh, uh, 20 years, there is any reason to think that the pattern is going to change in the coming years for refugees. So I, I, I think it is quite safe to anticipate that this is going to be, of course, with some degree of de-skilling or, or at least underutilization of their skills, but uh, this is not only this applies not only to those migrants, but to the migrants from many other countries. So uh, I, 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 I think that this is quite a safe bet to say that this is going to be the pattern of integration. And this is what they are. I, I have been looking at uh, uh, even press reports. They start working as uh, uh, cashiers in supermarkets, of course, care, of course. I mean, exactly this kind of jobs. Thank you. I would like to ask you, Ivan, you, you said now that you don't, you cannot see any potential for any positive side effects now of the treatment of Ukrainian refugees that would like spill down to other groups of refugees, so to speak. But to, uh, what do you think about the labor market policies, for instance, in, in a country as Spain? Do you think that there is potential for liberalizations of facilities for, that could also benefit other groups that are... Uh, uh, you, okay, you mean... Uh, you mean liberalization of access to work permits? Access to work permits, for instance, yes. Um, well, I mean, the, the, the policy in, in, in Spain, for instance, has already been for a long time. But, uh, they make whatever is possible to prevent people to join the territory and then to uh, join the uh, 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 country. And once they stay here, in Spain at least, at the end, they are regularized and, and they are offered work, uh, access to the uh, work uh, labor market. So I don't think this is going to change. What I mentioned is uh, uh, before is I don't see any uh, prospect or any hint anyway today that this uh, 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 new way of, uh, 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 I, I, I was listening the uh, 
director general for uh, refugee affairs uh, the other day. And she was saying, well, I'm convinced that the new structures and the new procedures we are establishing for refugees, for Ukrainian refugees will benefit other groups as well. I don't think so. They, they are not being expand, extended now to Venezuelan ones, for instance, which is a wide group where there are major issues and they are not benefiting from uh, these structures today. So, and not to mention uh, uh, other people, other refugees coming from other uh, uh, less uh, culturally uh, pro, uh, close than Venezuela. So I, I don't think it is going to change for good the uh, approach to refugee uh, assistance and not to uh, access to labor market. Uh, uh, and and, and, and I, I, I would even uh, uh, say that uh, uh, there are chances that in the coming two years, if the economic crisis really uh, 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 substantiates, we will see a backlash against migrants once again. Of course, not including refugees from Ukraine who will not be considered migrants by then. This is my, my, my but of course we don't know a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Ivan. If, if we don't have any other comments, we will move on to our fourth speaker, uh, who is Silvia Morgadas Gil. Uh, we'll approach the issue from a legal perspective, talking about <clears throat> activating temporary protection in Europe in the 21st century. Please uh, go ahead, Silvia. Okay, thank you, dear colleagues, audience. Thank you for being here. I'm convinced that you already know that only two weeks after the beginning of the war, the EU activated for the first time in its history a mechanism called temporary protection. At the universal level, temporary protection is more or less a principle or mainly a rule in construction, which is considered as one of the consequences of the more uh, established principle of non refoulement when it has to be applied in a case of massive influxes. In this kind of cases, it's impossible to pretend to apply asylum, individualized procedures. And so all the components of the groups of people arriving from, an, from, from a given area are considered as prima facie refugees and protected. In the EU, after the Balkans conflict in the 90s, a common European asylum system was established uh, and it includes a directive on temporary protection, which establishes a procedure and some rules in order to formalize this kind of protection in case of massive influxes taking part in Europe. In my intervention, I want to first revise the main facts and distinguishing features of the situation which are behind the activation of the temporary protection directive in the EU on 4 March 2022. Second, I will explain what exactly the activation of the temporary protection in Europe entails. And finally, I will critically explain what the activation of the temporary protection in Europe does not entail, and so is spending at the EU level. First of all, um, considering all the precedents of larger scale influxes of forced and migrants affecting Europe, I think that we can find three differentiating features in the Ukrainian current exodus. Uh, one is factual, uh, normative, and political. Uh, concerning the facts, the scale and the rapidity of flight of forced migrants is different from other situations since the World War II. According to the United, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, more than 13 million people are, have moved since the outbreak of the war and 10 million escaped from their place of residence in only one month. This is really exceptional. In one month, we had 3.7 million of refugees from Ukraine, while in 2015, we had a maximum of 1.4 million people asking for asylum in one year. Recent data suggests that 7.7 .7 million of people are internally displaced, so 17% of the population and 5.3 million are refugees. So they are outside of Ukraine and mainly in the Schengen area. From a normative perspective, the main difference is that Ukrainians have, since March 2017, the right 
to enter into the EU if they are in possession of a biometric passport and also the right to move freely across the EU for 90 days. For this reason, the main Dublin criteria for the allocation of the responsibility uh, to examine asylum applications and to take care of applicants is not strictly applicable. At least in the, in the last 20 years, the main part of refugees um, asking for protection in the EU were arriving by irregular ways without documentation allowing them to enter as migrants according to the European migration policy. In this case, immigration and visa policy have offered a legal and safe way to enter into the European Union. Approaches based on the criminalization of migration tends to define spontaneous migrants as irregular migrants. Refugees are also, um, are also increasingly seen as a particular kind of irregular migrants. It's noteworthy that, in, uh, that in, in, in one of the first speech condemning the aggression that uh, Ukraine was suffering, Josep Borrell, a high representative of the EU for external affairs, asked not to call U U Ukrainian people fleeing the war as migrants. He said, don't call them migrants. It's like saying, don't call them migrants because they are true refugees. From a political perspective, Ukraine is a country of origin as re uh, of refugees quite particular because it has four EU countries as border countries and is mainly approached by these frontline states as the uh, something, something like the natural interland connecting with the West. And precisely two of these countries, Poland and Hungary, were the most restrictive in terms of migration and solidarity as regards refugees and the rest of the states in the Mediterranean migratory crisis in, of 2015. This political aspect facilitated the concrete activation of the temporary protection instrument. Uh, and now I turn to the second part of my intervention. It's also well known that the unity among member states of the European Union has allowed uh, in this particular case to the EU to react to aggression with uh, many instruments of the EU external policy. And that this unity has also allowed to adopt the Council implementation decision of two, uh, sorry, of 4 March 2022, establishing the existence of mass influx of displaced persons from Ukraine and having the effect of introducing temporary protection. This decision was adopted by unanimity by the Council when a qualified majority was enough to adopt the rule. And it was the first time in around 20 years since the adoption of the Directive on International on Temporary Protection that this directive was triggered. Uh, this di direct directive was adopted during the so-called first phase of the common European asylum system and its reform in the context of the negotiation of the third phase is pending since the adoption of the new pact uh, on migration and asylum held in sept on September um, 2020. As regards the personal scope of application, in, uh, it's established in the implementing decision that is applicable to Ukrainian nationals visiting Ukraine before 24 February uh, 2022 stateless person and nationals of third countries other than Ukraine who benefited from international protection or equivalent national protection and family members of these both um, categories. The implementation decision establishes that the states can apply the decision to other categories of third country nationals and Spain, for example, has used this possibility because according to the Spanish temporary protection legal instrument, third country nationals residing in Ukraine who were already in Spain as tourists, students, etc., also benefit from temporary protection. As regards the content of the protection, it established in the directive that beneficiaries will benefit from a residence permit, uh, guarantees for access to asylum procedure, access to employment, accommodation, housing, social welfare, medical care, education, etc. This means that, in fact, Ukrainian refugees are allowed to choose where to go in the EU and to choose also the state where they will obtain some kind of international protection. Um, 
they can, as such, exercise the right to family unity in a broad uh, sense, to choose to go to one country for reasons related to family, social, cultural, linguistic ties, or even because of the labor qualifications, which can facilitate to find a job in one country uh, or in another country. Finally, concerning to what the temporary protection in the EU does not entail, but should, in my opinion, uh, is a compromise regarding solidarity in terms of relocation. According to the 2001 directive, the implementing decision by which the existence of a massive influx can be established should include information received from member states on their reception capacity. This has not been included in a concrete and detailed way in the implementing decision of 4 uh, March 2022. And it seems that according to the European Commission, the possibility to establish a relocation mechanism is not currently under the table. It, seemed that, it seems that this issue is not pressing for the EU nor for the member states, but in my opinion, it's necessary to deal with this issue when the war is far from being near to the end. The longer this war goes on, uh, the more pressing will be relocation because it will be impossible to assure a rapid and safe return. Just to finish, one final thought. In my opinion, even if far from being perfect, the response of the EU to the massive influx issued from the war at the gates of, at the gates of Europe is one of the elements uh, with the management of the response to the pandemic and other things which allow EU citizens to give value to the European political union as a guarantee to preserve human rights, freedoms, and other values related to democracy and the rule of law. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Silvia, for that. Uh, do we have any reactions, any questions? Um, it was uh, a very lots of information to process. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, yes, I actually was going to ask Sylvia just at the end to repeat what was what were you cautioning about because it was a lot of information, very fascinating <laughs> that you're saying that you recommend. Could you just repeat the last thought? Thank yes. you. Yes, I was saying that I think that it's it's lacking in the implementing decision. Um, uh, um, uh, an, an instrument of relocation. Um, in the directive of 2001, it was said that a mechanism of relocation of uh, capacity of a state should be uh, included in the implementation decision. And in this implementation decision, never has been included. Well, some, uh, some ideas on capacity of a state, but in a broad, um, uh, not, not concretely. And I think that uh, as we see that the war is, 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 is longer, is, is near from, um, from being um, at the end, I think it's necessary to, to, to have a provision on relocation among member states. Um, because uh, perhaps uh, Poland that has mm, more or less 3 million people uh, nowadays, it's calculated, perhaps they, uh, will not be able to assume and integrate all these people that cannot return in a safe manner in, in, in a brief delay. So I think that it's necessary to address the issue of relocation. Um, I don't know if compulsory relocation, but uh, in my opinion, it should be compulsory relocation among member states. We are 27 member states, and, and, and nowadays, the, the main affected states are Poland, Hungary, and, and other states at the front line and in the, the West, in the East of, of Europe. And in my opinion, relocation should be addressed now in order to be uh, prepared for the moment um, that is needed to, to relocate people that cannot safely return uh, to their um, country of origin. Thank you. Ed, Ivan? Yeah, I think I think this is this reflects what I was telling before that the, the modelic I would say, and I think it is in many ways modelic uh, uh, reaction to the refugee uh, flow from Ukraine is not going to change anything for good in uh, the uh, relation to other 
nationalities, another refugee flows. I uh, uh, listened the other day, uh, a representative of the Polish embassy saying very clearly, we don't want any mechanism of reallocation, even for Ukrainians. We want funding. Uh, and, and this is not related to Ukrainians, of course, it is mainly related to uh, other refugees coming to the Mediterranean and uh, uh, Poland, Hungary, and Slovakia and other countries refusing any formula for reallocation. I think it is important and I, I think it reflects that uh, in the uh, 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 bottom line discussion of migration policies and the new pact on asylum and migration that has not been adopted, has only, the, only been proposed so far, uh, uh, nothing has changed. And even this uh, uh, emergence in this flow could make things even worse. This is at least one possibility. Silvia, do you want to react to that? I want to, to, I want to think that Europe is capable to, to improve their reactions vis-a-vis uh, -vis refugee crisis. But um, it's worrying that this fact that this, um, this, uh, this, what uh, Ivan has said that um, peop um, uh, states nowadays do not want to, to, to think um, on relocation and, and to, to compromise on relocation. Yes, uh, but uh, I have the, 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 the hope that, that uh, Europe is capable to, to learn from past uh, and that uh, uh, perhaps in other crises will um, we'll manage to, to be more, um, more open. I don't know. Yes, but I, 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 I recognize that the case of Ukrainians is very particular because the entry is assured by the policy on immigration because they have the possibility to enter as regular migrants. But Silvia, Silvia, I, 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 I understand it as a hope. And, and <laughs> we know now, we know now that Europe can do it, but uh -huh. it is willing to do it. I mean, what has changed in the situation of uh, Moroccan and Algerians in Canary Islands? Nothing. I mean, we are preparing very good housing facilities for Ukrainian refugees. Whereas the uh, Algerians and Moroccans stuck in the Canary Islands are still in the same poor conditions that they were before. Today, today, we are not uh, talking even about the future. We are talking about a very clear discriminatory approach to refugee assistance depending on the on the categories. Very clear. So I I I I I I I, I, I think it can. Of course Europe can do it if it wants. The issue is does it want? Yeah, but in one case they have the right to enter, in the other case they, they do not have the right to enter. And this defines the, 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 the difference between what, what we see as migrants and what we see as refugees. Um, why uh, Jose Borrell said, don't call them migrants? Because they are refugees. This was, I think, behind the, this, this sentence, don't call them migrants, that he repeated an, uh, one time and another time. Behind this, is, it was this, Ukrainians are refugees and other people that, that come to Europe perhaps are not refugees and they are migrants. And we know that the, the, that flows are mixed flows and, and we have some refugees in, in, in Canary Islands and in other places. But the majority of them are seen as migrants and the majority of Ukrainians, because they have the right to enter, are um, considered as mm, refugees. But. <laughs> well, I guess one, one last sentence. I mean, uh, I, this is clear. You are explaining it very well but it reflects the hypocrisy of this difference between migrants and refugees. I mean, instead of using a very clear category of persons in need, that's it. I mean, because then according to this, yes, maybe tomorrow it will deal very well with all refugees, according to the Geneva Convention, which are a very, very small majority, a small portion of all uh, 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 irregular migrants flows. So. I don't think this will solve anything or will uh, actually 
uh, allow us to say that Europe is facing its uh, responsibilities in this field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I can add, yes, that yes, the question also to Celia from the legal point of view, uh, the, the distinction between migrant and refugee, uh, it's not related really to whether one can enter freely or not, right? It's uh, it's not about that. No, it's about the need of protection no, that defines the refugee status. But yes, of course. Mm, the difference is, is the fear of persecution or fear to be to, to be submitted to, to inhuman or degrading treatment, etc. Um, but in general, uh, if if we we know, legal categories are very clear, but the difficulty is to to apply legal categories to the reality, because refugees, in principle, by the not of human principle, can enter into the uh, into one country, into the safe country where they um, find to 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 be uh, present. Um, nevertheless, uh, the European Union and other uh, and other areas have constructed this idea that's based on the criminalization of migration, the idea of security, securitization of migration. Have constructed the idea of of migrants as as a threat to the security. And among migrants, we, we find refugees. If we were capable to, to distinguish at the, at, in the point of entry who are refugees and who are not refugees, uh, refugees have the right to enter. But we prefer, in general, European societies, we prefer to, 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 to have them abroad and to, to keep them abroad of the European Union in order to avoid the, 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 the taking the responsibility uh, that the Northern Fulman imposes to us. And for this reason, the United Kingdom that is not part in the European Union has managed to, to, uh, to, to have an agreement with Rwanda in order to, to proceed the asylum application uh, in this country uh, and not to proceed the asylum application in, in the United Kingdom because the European Union has the, uh, one main problem is that the policy of return is non is non-effective. The policy of return, it, of return um, manages to, uh, to return le less than a half percent of people that have a, an issue of expulsion. So if we have migrants that call for uh, having uh, the status of refugee in Europe and we deny the status of refugee, we do not manage to return them. And for this reason, it's better not to, to have them inside the European Union, not to allow them to enter. In the case of Ukrainians, they have the right to enter. It's the policy on immigration and the visa policy that allow them to enter, not the refugee policy or the asylum policy of the European Union. Thank you for that explanation, TV. I just have another question, short, uh, short question. Do you think that if in a worst case scenario, this war continues now uh, for, for months, even years. So, and, and, and the number of Ukrainian refugees reaches 10 million, 15 million. Who knows? Now, what, what would be the European response at some At what point would Europe start creating refugee camps or trying to send them to Rwanda or somewhere else? Now, what, what, when do you think that the solidarity, relative solidarity, you know, would, would change? I'm unable to to think on on this on this. Um, I think that yes, uh, Ukraine 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 has uh, 40 million people Ukrainian inside Ukraine. It's impossible that all of them are able to to flee. Uh, it's impossible. I think that reality imposes some limits. You United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees thinks on 10 million, 15 million people. It's difficult to say. I think that in this case, in this concrete case, um, uh, Europe is not uh, in, a, in a position to, to think on limits. Limits uh, will be um, bring by reality. How many people are able to, to, to flee from, uh, from Ukraine and, and reality imposes a number that is uh, lower, I think, than 20 million, in my opinion, but it's difficult to say. I don't know. Okay. Thank you uh, for that. And let's move on now to John Palmer uh, and his presentation about lessons from Bosnia and Kosovo, refugees' rights and criminal responsibility in international law. Thanks. Um, 
So, so actually, to, to pick up a little bit on this debate directly, I, I think in general that to the extent that we do see any positive changes coming out of this, it's going to be through legal developments and institutional developments, right? And I think if you look at at the history of, you know, so the expansion of refugee rights with starting with the Refugee Convention um, throughout the 20th century and then sort of contraction, it's been uh, this combination of political developments that lead to sort of solidifying legal and institutional developments that then constrain states to some extent. And many of those legal developments actually came out of the Cold War and came out of, out of you know, interstate rivalries and, and uh, Western states trying to show um, some sort of you know, moral upper hand by, by creating mechanisms for asylum um, for people fleeing, fleeing um, from, from particular states. And that, those then got sort of locked into the system and led to an expansion to some extent of, of, of rights of refugees. Um, what I want to focus on now is actually another area that I think needs to be very much thought about when we think about the rights of refugees, and that's international criminal law. We often separate these two bodies of law. And the lesson that I want to draw from the former Yugoslavia, and Silvia already mentioned the wars in the Balkans, um, is, is exactly that one. And I think, I think the comparison to the wars in the former Yugoslavia is, is useful, although obviously there's many other places that we can look at many other refugee situations that we could draw useful comparisons from. And there's obviously important differences, right? Yugoslavia was not the Soviet Union. Um, Bosnia is not, you know, there's many, many differences between these situations, both historical and political, um, and in terms of, as, as many of you have pointed out, in terms of scale, right? Just in terms of the size of the populations involved. But, you know, uh, prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, in terms of European displacement, it was the wars in, in Bosnia and in Croatia, Bosnia and Kosovo that had led to the largest displacements of people within Europe, both internal displacements and, and refugee flows. And that was during the 1990s. Also, uh, as in Ukraine, the war in, in Bosnia in particular involved a larger state um, attacking a much smaller, uh, uh, much smaller forces that were struggling to defend themselves. And in the case of the war in Bosnia, Milosevic based his case for, um, for the use of force on the supposed need to protect ethnic Serbs in territories outside of Serbia. Uh, and he used blatantly false propaganda about, in fact, genocide being committed against the Serbs and about the rise of Nazism in Croatia and, and in Bosnia um, to justify uh, widespread atrocities, uh, including um, mass executions, torture, rape, um, detention, expulsion, uh, and many things that sound awfully familiar when we look at what's happening in Ukraine. There are a lot of other parallels, and I think in, in listening to your talks, you, you see a lot of parallels, including starting with, with Lorenzo's talk about the way Bosnian, well, first Croatian and Bosnian and, and Kosovo refugees were treated in Europe, right? You did see that difference in how they were treated. With, with obviously some distinctions. The religious, there was a religious component that was different with, with Bosnian Muslim refugees and Kosovo um, Muslim refugees. Um, but there was very different, you know, there was a very clear difference in the way the media treated them and in the way European states treated them. And we had many of these same debates that we're having right now. We had debates about temporary protection, even though it wasn't within the EU framework, but there were debates about temporary protection at the time as well. So I think it's useful to look back at that case um, as an example that we can learn from. And one of the things that I think is really important and the thing that, that strikes me most is the connection between the atrocities that were being committed um, and the flow of refugees. The connection is obvious, right? We know that people were fleeing from the atrocities, um, but there was also a tension between those, those two things. And many actors uh, in particularly in Bosnia saw the refugees as a humanitarian problem that needed to be addressed through material aid. And that had a way of pushing aside other questions of their rights, right? Other questions of refugee rights, including questions of international protection, um, but also questions of simply their basic human rights, their rights not to be persecuted and, and the ultimate you know, root cause of why they were, why they were fleeing. Um, and that led to you know, some startling and quite horrific um, events, including you know, most notably probably the UN peacekeeping forces uh, negotiation with the Bosnian Serb forces surrounding Sarajevo to make use of the airport for humanitarian aid, which then meant that the UN peacekeeping forces were 
ended up in the job of actually stopping people from fleeing Sarajevo. Uh, and then, of course, the well-known establishment of so-called um, uh, humanitarian safe areas in, in Zhepa and Srebrenica, in which the Bosnian Muslim forces were disarmed for humanitarian purposes so that they could be supposedly protected, and then the UN peacekeeping forces utterly failed to protect them. Right? Those things are well known. And those are just you know, among some of the many events that happened in that war that led to kind of this very clear view of, of the problem of separating sort of humanitarian material aid from other basic questions of rights. Um, of course, alongside that, there was development in not just refugee law, but also international criminal law. We have the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, alongside the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And this was the start of you know, a big growth in international criminal law, where there was then subsequent creation of additional criminal tribunals, uh, and ultimately the International Criminal Court uh, through, the, through the Rome Statute. Um, the ICTY ultimately charged 160 people with, uh, with war crimes or crimes against humanity. Uh, they managed to sentence 90 people, including Radko, Radko Mladic and Radovan Karadzic, who are currently serving uh, uh, prison sentences in the UK. Uh, and they also almost completed the trial of Slobodan Milosevic, who then died before the trial was concluded. So we then fast forward 30 years. In fact, it's almost exactly 30 years from the beginning of the war in Bosnia. And we have a somewhat similar conflict on a much larger scale. Uh, and um, with a number of developments that proceeded from the establishment of those, tri those tribunals, including the International Criminal Court. And we already see the International Criminal Court, the prosecutor having started investigations, and we see a lot of talk about what role international criminal law could play in the war in, in Ukraine. And the basic point that I wanna make is that we have to, this is something we have to focus on if we care about understanding and also supporting refugees. Right? We, we cannot avoid focusing on this. Uh, and I think that the efforts of the International Criminal Court and possibilities of creating a special tribunal that would be involved, that would be necessary if the crime of aggression would be tried, are really, really important and deserve support um, and shouldn't be separated from our kind of discussions about refugees. Uh, a few, um, first of all, a few important reasons for thinking that. One is simply not to repeat the, the same obvious mistakes that we saw in, in, uh, in the former Yugoslavia. Um, the second is to increase some, some, to some extent, as much as it's limited in person, imperfect, the possibility of actual deterrence for these types of crimes. And um, with the deterrence question, it's often, I think, the detractors of, of international criminal law often focus on the cases where it hasn't functioned, the right, perpetrators and large number of perpetrators have not ever been held accountable, particularly in powerful states. Um, but to the extent that it forces at least some of those people to think twice, to have their legal advisors tell them that they may ultimately face the risk of some sort of criminal liability, that their travel may be restricted. Um, and even more so to the extent that it forces lower level people who may feel less protected to think twice about going along uh, and, and, and being complicit in, in these types of crimes, then I think it's really, really important. A few possible objections that you tend to hear about focusing on prosecutions already uh, in Ukraine. One of which is that, well, it makes negotiating a peace more difficult, right? So we often, and you know, in a way, this is the same type of argument that we had in the former Yugoslavia when it came to negotiating access for humanitarian aid, right, or for evacuations, or for the for the arrival of aid, um, and there's a concern that if people are indicted for war crimes, they're going to be harder to negotiate with. That's presumably an issue, but it's definitely not a you know it's not one that needs to fully obstruct the possibility of negotiation. And in many ways, negotiations are going to take place either way. I mean, this the same goes for the argument about military aid to Ukraine. Negotiations are going to happen. And really what we're talking about is the context in which they happen, right? What, what, what's the playing field on which those negotiations take place? And in many respects, it's useful to have them taking place with what, you know, for many of these crimes is, is pretty apparent that they're being committed and who the perpetrators, perpetrators are already on the table, if not in the investigation stage, even potentially in 
um, in the charging stage. Um, another objection is, well, this is really um, hypocritical of, of Western states to talk about this when they're constantly guilty of, of international crimes. And my response to that is that's one of the important reasons for, in fact, pushing this forward. And that goes back to the point that I made in the beginning, which is that change, a lot of the types of changes that we, you know, that we've seen, or to the extent that there are positive developments that could come out of this, they're going to happen through locking in these types of institutional changes, right? So it's not a question of whether states that have been, you know, states that have had as, as states responsibility for violating international law are now being hypocritical or whether individuals in those states are also being hypocritical. It's a question of whether we can bring about legal developments, which would actually uh, make it less likely for that to happen by anybody. And in fact, potentially held some of those people in account as well. Right now, there's something quite surprising in the United States, which has not only first resisted, but then actively undermined the International Criminal Court for many years, and particularly under the Trump administration when they actually sanctioned uh, uh, ICC prosecutors, um, and as well as quite absurd and, and horrifying legislation aimed at um, protecting uh, US forces from prosecution, you all of a sudden have support within the US Congress, including from Republicans, you have support for some sort of international criminal justice, including potential support for the ICC. And I said, we should take advantage of that. We should take advantage of it in order to try to give that court more power in order to try to give it more power, not just in being able to prosecute cases in Ukraine, but also to be able to prosecute cases all over the world, and including to instill some level of fear in actors in the US and other Western states. So I'll leave it at that, and I'm um, happy to discuss further. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. That's also the presentation that's more focused on the actual war going on now, and that may perhaps be more difficult for some of us, at least as migration scholars, to, to approach or to comment on. I don't know if we have anyone who dares to enter that debate. I'm... I myself uh, feel quite reluctant, I have to say, to comment on that aspect of it, though I, I very much find it very, very, very relevant what you're saying. Uh, anybody here with more connections maybe to international relations debates? Mm. Ilvi, are you waving? Yes. Thank yes. Um, I want to, to, to ask, uh, why do you think this new proposal will have an advantage taking into account uh, the the, the problems of the International Court of Justice of the International Criminal Court to, to deal with this, uh, with this kind of, of, of crimes. So, In yeah, which no. Your proposal will, will overcome these difficulties. I, I, I am not able so, to. So, so two, I guess two reasons. One of the main problems the International Criminal Court has faced is lack of funding for investigations. Another major problem it's faced is being, you know, is lack, lack of important states parties, including um, the United States and Russia, and uh, and being actively undermined by the United States. And I think to the extent that it can now have a possibility of actually carrying out investigations, getting more funding, and getting more political support from the United States uh, and from other states, I think that's that opens up a big possibility. In terms of other potential obstacles, there's the jurisdiction. You know, there's always the jurisdictional question. But in this case, the International Criminal Court actually has jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute the atrocity crimes being convicted on the territory of Ukraine. And that's by virtue of the fact that Ukraine has consented to that starting in 2014, right? Ukraine's not a party to the ICC, Russia's not a party to the ICC, but through the consent of a state, um, the, three, the three big categories of crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes and genocide, uh, are something that the court has jurisdiction to investigate and to prosecute on that territory. It doesn't have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, uh, right, which is which is added by um, separately with the Kampala Protocol, um, unless you know unless the Security Council would somehow refer it, which is not going to happen unless there's a, you know a major political change in Russia. Um, that's where the possibility of a of a special tribunal comes in, and there's lots of debates over how such a tribunal should be should be constituted. 
I think the most important thing right now would be that the International Criminal Court gets support to investigate the atrocity crimes being committed. And that's also where the deterrent effect can come in. The crime of aggression is the most obvious one, right? There's almost no question that Russia has committed the crime of aggression in, in the most major way possible and in kind of like the textbook case that everybody was thinking about when the UN Charter was written. Um, and it's a crime that in fact was, was very much created by a Soviet legal scholar, which is quite interesting, right? It's, this, is, this is not something that comes sort of out of the West and is being imposed on, on Russia. This, this comes out of, out, of, out of Soviet legal thought in, prior to and during the Second World War. Um, that would take that that takes a special tribunal and there's lots of debates over how that should should be set up if it should be set up how it would mesh with ukrainian law um and sort of where it would be constituted and how that would work but in terms of actually deterring uh you know what individual soldiers are doing on the ground or what decisions commanders are making investigating the atrocity crimes is really really key and again just just to just to be clear i think this does and i i i, I think what zinnia is saying is absolutely right in the sense that we mostly don't focus on this. And, and my point is that we should, right? My main proposal is that as, as migration scholars, we need to focus on this, right? If, if we wanna really understand the situation of refugees. Thank you, John. Jenna, please. Yeah, um, John, you had mentioned that uh, indicting people for war crimes makes them hard, harder to negotiate for, with for obvious reasons. And I'm curious if, you know of any examples maybe during the 90s of like kind of maybe what um how those negotiations went down once people were indicted like what happened if there were any other arguments made besides like yeah. you know revoking um that um that indictment well i mean i guess i guess the most the best example would be milosevic milosevic was indicted in i think may of 1999 mm -hmm. and yet the yugoslavia was still willing and able to negotiate the Kumanovo agreement a few months later with NATO that ended the NATO bombing campaign of Kosovo or of Serbia. Um, and so there's an example of somebody who was indicted, who was able, who in fact was still willing to negotiate. Uh, there was the case of, of Mladic and Katerjic who were indicted before the Dayton Accords in Bosnia, right? They were indicted in, I think, November of 1995. Um, they you know, they were still willing to go along with giving Milosevic authority to negotiate, well, authority to negotiate on their behalf to sign Dayton. Um, ultimately, Milosevic had a lot more power than they did. So, I mean, it's, I'm not, it's not entirely clear how much, how much they're, you know, how much that mattered. But um, there, there's, I think it's a good question. That, that if I remember, there was definitely issues of what their role would be given that they were, all, they were already indicted and there's, there's a lot more that I, that I should look into. Um, there was the issue after Dayton was signed of the indicted war criminals, right? And this was something that I, I directly observed and participated in. You had for a number of years in Bosnia, you had people who we knew were indicted in positions of power and walking publicly around Republic of Srpska and many other places. Uh, and they were actively obstructing one of the main parts of Dayton, which was the refugee return part, right? The, the right of people to return to areas where they were an ethnic minority. Um, this is something I saw in, in Eastern Bosnia and Focha. Uh, there were the people who had been on the crisis committee of Focha municipality who'd been directly responsible for killing and expelling Muslims and setting up a rape camp in the hotel. Uh, we actually had a legal aid center in that same hotel and one of the lawyers ended up going to represent one of the, one of the indicted war criminals from Focha later on. Um, and until, those, until there, was, there was, at a certain point, there was a turning point in the relationship that the, um, that the high representative and the peace in the NATO forces in Bosnia had with those people. And they started to actually get arrested several years later. And that's when minority returns started happening, right? So there, unfortunately, nobody was, you know, able to go back who was a non-Serb. Almost nobody could go back until, I guess, 1998 or 1999, when some of the major war criminals who were still in Fodra got finally got arrested. And there, and there was, you know, the debate over like peace versus justice was was clearly, you know, that was clearly an important debate. And when they were arrested, there was rioting. Um, but afterwards, people who, who for, for many years hadn't been able to return their, to their homes suddenly could. Thank you, John. Uh, thanks for that analysis. And in general, also, thank you for that comment, which I think is very relevant. And maybe that could even be a seminar in itself one, some, at one occasion, some occasion talking about how we as migration scholars perhaps need to give more space to, to the 
complex factors that generate human movement. No? And not only wars, of course, but also poverty, for instance, at the, at the global level. So, so absolutely, I think this is a very relevant comment. Thanks. And Maiva, we have a question there. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I don't know if it's exactly a question, but just uh, an idea that came to mind uh, about the relation between, between investigation on, in, in the criminal law aspect and maybe the protection of refugees. Just what came to mind was that uh, the protection of Ukrainian nationals now in the EU is according to the temporary protection, like Sylvia explained. And uh, there are questions about in the long term, or what would what would they become? Uh, obviously, in the worst case scenario, in which uh, there is a need for longer protection than what the temporary protection can provide. But in this sense, then there would be a need to go from temporary protection, which is kind of an automatic protection given to anyone who is left between these days, who has uh, the passport or corresponds to to the criteria. So moving from this automatic protection to a protection based on possible persecutions or possible um risks if they return and maybe there i don't know um how it could work but maybe there if there is uh inquiries uh about atrocities that are being committed have been committed or are being committed maybe this this could help in a way and i'm thinking maybe in particular about the donbass region because there has been a war there since 2014 really and um, and yeah, this is quite a specific uh, a specific situation for those people who are supposedly Ukrainians, but they also have a different passport. They have possibly a Russian passport, and and yeah, and I think there were discussions about um, at the international level about criminal per prosecution or criminal investigation on this war, even before the the current one. So yeah, I don't know, maybe. Articulating all of this could be useful also for protection for the protection of the people from from there. Thank you. It's not really a question, but <laughs> no, no, I think it's a good, I think it's a very good point. Um, I mean, I think that there's two points. One is the process, one is kind of investigations and prosecution, and other, other the other is of course the individualized assessment of, of protection needs, which which is what what ends up not happening with temporary protection. Um, and again, that, that came up exactly in the case of the former Yugoslavia. There was, and in fact, that, that was one of the things that kind of brought to a head the question of minority returns, which made a lot of people see that this, this sort of deal of, well, letting the war, you know, people indicted for war crimes remain in positions of power wasn't going to work because European states wanted to return a large number of refugees to Bosnia, right? So that all of a sudden there was political pressure from European states who had granted temporary protection and, um, and for the people who were, you know, people who were from areas where there were an ethnic majority, it wasn't an issue other than the housing question, which is often the problem that you had people from the other areas, like people from you know, Muslims who fled to Eastern Bosnia were living in a, an apartment of somebody who'd fled from Sarajevo. So for the person from Sarajevo to come back, the person from Eastern Bosnia needed to be able to go back to the house. And then you had somebody in that municipality saying, no way they can't come back. Um, so there, there was the, there you could very clearly see the linkage. Um, but at the same time, I think what you're saying is as well in terms of the individualized assessment is really, really important. And there's going to be a lot of very, you know, very important cases to consider, including people from those areas, right, who may, if, you know, if Ukraine were to succeed in driving out Russian forces, there may very well be people aligned with Russia who end up with very solid asylum claims in, you know, outside of Ukraine who can't go back. There's another part which actually relates a little bit to this question of, of, of the crime of aggression or a war of aggression which is that Russian soldiers should have a very valid claim. Russian soldiers who don't want to serve should have a very valid claim to asylum, right? So if, if, you're, if you're fearing persecution for refusing to take part in a war that's in clear breach of international law, that's in the refugee in the UNHCR's handbook, that's one of the grounds that people should be granted asylum under. And there's actually some interesting analysis on that. Uh, and that's an area that I think would be really useful for European states to kind of publicize and say, look, we should, we should be accepting Russian soldiers who don't want to fight. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I agree with this. And also, especially in this, this part, this region, the Donbass region, loads of people have been taken to war on the Russian side, even though they're Ukrainians. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, this is absolutely yeah. problematic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this debate. And let's proceed now to the last speaker today, uh, who is Gemma Pinol Jimenez. 
Hey, we're going to talk about uh, beyond the temporary protection directive, how EU countries are responding to non-Ukrainian citizens seeking for protection. So we could say that we're back a bit to where we started now in uh, placing the treatment of uh, Ukrainian refugees in relation to other groups of refugees. So, so please, Gemma. Thank you, Shenya, and thank you all for being here at this moment. And uh, it's nice to see so many familiar faces without the mask. Sorry for saying that, but this is something that I was like uh, dying for <laughs> to see. So yeah, I'm going a bit back uh, following what Sylvia has said and also the discussion that uh, she and Ivan has taken about the positivity or whatever we are living in this moment, just to talk a bit about how the uh, EU countries have uh, applicate has developed this uh, directive of uh, temporary protection mainly because I think that uh, I think that this is a very interesting debate uh, nowadays and it's very in the public uh, scenarios about the the idea of um, that this uh, uh, meaning the <clears throat> The implementation or the taking off of the directive has been a, a show off of the double standards of the EU regarding refugees from different parts of the world. And I think that in my point of view, this could be discussed and could be true, but the most important thing is how the EU countries have implemented the directive itself because the, the directive give a room for a very different ways to deal with the refugees coming from Ukraine, being Ukrainian or non-Ukrainian nationals. And I think that this is a very important point in terms of talking about our standards, because yes, I think that in this case, it's essential to see how they are talking about that. And I think it's interesting mainly because, uh, as you know, when the, when the proposal of the implementation of the directive was presented from the commission to the council, the commission includes all people flowing from Ukraine in the proposal. It was the idea was all people uh, that was in, uh, in Ukraine and was fleeing from Ukraine should give and should be given the temporary protection in the EU member states. What happened between the presentation of the commission's proposal and the decision that was taken uh, by the council was that this distinction was uh, disappeared and there is, we create like three different groups. Uh, national from Ukraine that for sure are going to be protected by the directive. People who has been uh, in uh, Ukraine with a refugee or kind of international protection uh, uh, situation, it's also included in that. And then the directive, the decision says that member states could choose which kind of treatment they're going to provide to non-national uh, or nationals of third countries fleeing from Ukraine that were not Ukrainian. I, I don't know, it's clear the, the difference when you say non-national at the end, because you don't know what kind of nationals are you talking about. But the idea is that we split, uh, and it was a decision of the, of the council, mainly provoked and mainly uh, influenced by the, the, the 4B, the Visegrad countries that uh, try to emphasize that. And uh, it's interesting to see that I mean, despite this, uh, this situation that I think it's a very important in terms of what I'm going to explain, that this decision, the, the commission proposal and the difference between the, the commission proposal and the council decision, I think it's important because in terms, may, maybe not about uh, in terms of application, but in terms of sending messages, for me, it's really important. Meaning when you send a message that people could be differently treated according to the nationality flying from the same conflict, you are sending a very strong message. And I'm not pretty sure this is the message that we want to send, but in any case, it's the message that, the, that you send. And the most interesting thing is that if you see and check how many countries are uh, trying to apply the directive, uh, the protection of the temporary pro the protection directive uh, to only U uh, Ukrainian nationals, it's really a few ones. It's not the majority of the countries, mainly it's uh, Hungarian for sure. It's Austria, that it's not also surprising. It's some uh, Baltic countries, Estonia specifically. In any case, it's not the big majority. So it's worse for me in terms of understanding how the decision was taken to see that something that it's only been used for a small few number of countries 
is the, is the rule of the majority. Because when you have this in so many, when this minority and really, really discussed uh, position takes the rule from the majority, this is really serious in terms of what happens in the European Council, because this is really an imbalance of the, the positions. Um, and it's interesting that, for instance, Poland applies the protection, uh, the direct, the temporary protection for all people with some specificities. I'm going to talk about that, a bit, but meaning the idea is that in the papers, in the Poland and the Polish uh, ministry, it's included all of them. So meaning that why we need to take care about the minority voices of countries that doesn't comply with the international law. This is for me something that we need to, to think about because it's something that says a lot about the, the future of the uh, European project if it's the European Council who takes the who takes the decision. So the most of the other I'm sorry, the most of the other countries, the, the vast majority applies the temporary protection director uh, directive to nationals uh, from Ukraine and non-nationals that comes also from from Ukraine. This seems at the very beginning nice. It's okay. But what we have been seeing in different countries is that the procedures and the mechanisms are not similar. And this again generates uh, a situation. There is part of the differences in the treatment that are clear and, and Sylvia has explained where, uh, because it's, it's easy to understand that people that has uh, a free Schengen visa uh, for the uh, short term doesn't need to have the same, uh, to go, for instance, to ask for a lot of uh, registrations or whatever, because they are, in fact, uh, with a legal permit in the country. So some of the countries have say, for the Ukrainian nationals, you just don't need to do anything else than uh, apply and register yourself at, at local level, or maybe send some kind of information. But there is no need to open a process because a lot of countries have just said to the Ukrainian nationals that the visa permits are going to be non, uh, non stop till the end, meaning they don't create um, a specific uh, procedure. In other countries, yes, for instance, in the case of Spain, nationals of uh, Ukrainian nationals should ask for and apply for the temporary directive. So this is different and for sure that generates a lot of differences in terms of timings and uh, in terms of having the necessity to ask for a, a work permit. In some countries, the, the, the national legislation says you don't need a specific work permit with the, you, you, we understand that with uh, only with showing us that you are a, uh, Ukrainian national, everything could be going on. So it's been different in the in the tense. But I think that beyond this difference that could be understood in terms of having or not having the, um, the, current, uh, the current documentation or whatever, we have been seeing different in treatments in terms of uh, situations that are really complex. For instance, people coming from Ukraine, but non-Ukrainian, that has less possibilities to access to the uh, accommodation centers in some European countries. There is kind of been uh, situations of discrimination in, uh, in Belgium, in a lot of places, and uh, it's, it's not need to, to make a, a list on that. And then we also know that there is differences of treatment from Roma nationals. This is Roma Ukrainian nationals and Roma population in some of the in some of the countries, mainly in the in the third countries. So what I'm trying to say with that is that yes, um, there are some countries that really, really distinguish from the beginning from nationality. Others not, but then this distinguish appears in the procedures and in the treatment of the of the population. And um, I have to say that just to accept, uh, to, accept, to put an exception that it's true that in the case of Spain they have taken the opportunity with the temporary the, the temporary protection directive to to do uh, a small mini regularization that has passed without any kind of social and political controversial that it's amazing how when you can and when you can something that it's in general so uh, harsh in terms of uh, social discussion has passed without any comment and any kind of uh, media attention and, and whatever that for me it's uh, it's positive so what i'm trying to say with that and i'm going to to finish because it's uh, we're running off of time is that i don't think or, or maybe i think but plus that the vulneration of the right of asylum it's not only or is not mainly based in the use of different instruments in different situations 
Meaning I understand that it's not the same being uh, first time, first territory of arrival and second territory of arrival. So for me, the use of instruments should not be used as an excuse or an, uh, a way to, uh, to judge. I think that the most important thing is that we judge that we pro and that we protect the right of asylum for all people, and then we can decide that. And also that I think that it's clearly a vulneration of the right of asylum to use the same instruments, same instrument for a conflict, but treat people differently uh, because of their nationality. That for me, it's clearly a vulneration of what the right of asylum has been produced for. People coming from the same conflict with different nationalities cannot be treated differently. And, and as we have normalized that, I think that we are all part of this problem of uh, you know, reducing, progressively reducing the right of, of asylum in, in Europe, but also uh, worldwide, because this is not, unfortunately, something that it's only happening here, but it's like a general, uh, a general, uh, a general symptomatic uh, problem that we have facing this, this day. So I may stop here, and I don't know if you have any kind of questions or that that we can talk about thank you thank you very much Yema, uh, for that intervention and it's also important to raise that that concern although we sometimes in this debate we may tend to frame it as as a, an exception in other terms now a more generous uh, asylum application in, in the european context but then only for for Ukrainian nationals, which is of course very alarming. No? So it's very well the other way around. Really. What do you think about that? Yeah, Sylvia, do you have any, any comments? Yes, um, yes. Uh, thank you, Gemma, for your intervention. That has raised to me two, two, two questions or two, two thoughts. First of all, you, you, were, you were wondering why um, this change between the proposal and the implementing decision. And I have already said that it was not necessary. If, if only Hungary, Austria, and Estonia do not apply this, uh, this distinction for other third country nationals, it was not necessary because the implementing decision, um, it was possible to, to adopt the implementing decision by ma um, qualified majority. And if if any if Poland is, is has a number of population, but Hungary, Austria, and Estonia was it's not enough to to block the this implementing decision, um, adopting uh, this decision by a qualified majority. So it was not technically necessary to 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 make this distinction. And so in this sense, I I think that perhaps there are two reasons. First of all, the reason of the symbolism of unity. I think that the, the, one of the surprises of this crisis has been the reaction, the unitary reaction of the European Union. It, it's the first time in the history of the external relations policy of the European Union that the, the European Union uh, reacts um, with this unity. So I think that the symbolism to adopt this uh, implemented decision by unity by unanimity is is something that is important for the European Union. Um, so th there is a mes message behind this this decision, um, and I think that the second reason is is the necessity not to delay the decision. It, it was important to to react rapidly, and uh, I think I have to calculate, but less than two weeks after the beginning of the war, the, de the implementation decision was adopted. It was adopted one um, on Friday, and uh, and in the evening was uh, published in the official journal. This is very exceptional. Normally, decisions are adopted one day, and Monday are published in the official journal. So, this idea of uh, acting un uh, by unanimity, um, showing to the world the unity of the member states of the union is important, and to react rapidly it was important. This is my first reflection on your on your ideas and and on your final thought you said that this difference uh, difference between uh, ukrainian people and other third country nationals that flee from ukraine is breaching the right to asylum i'm not sure 
because uh, I, I agree with you that this creates a, a non um, uh, justified differentiation. This can breed the principle of non discrimination um, as regards, um, I don't know, refu refugee law, etc. I, I agree with this, but it's not breaching the right of asylum because uh, these people that do no benefit, do no ben sorry, don't benefit from uh, the temporary protection are allowed to ask for asylum um, following the, the, the normal, normalized way. So the, 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 the instruments of asylum are open for them, but the possibility to obtain a permit of residence and to have access to labor bargains, etc., is not automatic. It, they have to, to, to follow the, the complete procedure of asylum uh, in any state where they where they are. So I do not see the the breach to the right to asylum or to the regime or regime on the direction of protection. I see a non justified discrimination because they flee from the same country. But I, I I'm I'm not sure if I'm explaining to myself. No no perfectly and and I think it's absolutely correct what you say. Meaning in terms of. Uh, Asylum right, maybe it's not the, the end of the asylum right, but I think that the vulneration of a right, it's not only the application, it's also how it is constructed as a social element and something that should be protected. And my thoughts were more in that in that line, that this is not something that is related to the procedures are well done or whatever, it's that we are uh, eliminating the possibilities to so many people to ask for asylum and we are cre creating and generating so many barriers and so many elements to do that, that at the end, but it's seems that it's going to happen is that right of asylum doesn't matter for the people and this for me it's the message that i was trying to say but uh and, and it's the same with the first question because i absolutely could agree with you in terms of why it has happened um i i, I has been told how was the the meeting and uh, they told me about the position the hard position between poland and hungary and i for sure you can absolutely assume that in in terms and in the name of unity and speed you can delete the contents, but for me, this is not uh, this is not necessary. In the case of the Ukrainian population, in the case of the Ukrainian population, and not all the other non-national from 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 Ukraine, you have 19 days, for sure, 19 days that you can uh, no need to uh, respond to these people, meaning that you just need to respond the non-Ukrainian in terms of having the. The, the, the asylum or the protection or whatever you want to do in terms of uh, inflow of fir, uh, first arrival uh, after the, the invasion. So you want to show a speed because you want to show a political uh, message to the Russian. It's not about the refugees. Refugees doesn't care. It was uh, the use of, the, of this topic as something that do you want to show to the Russian uh, government that you are united and you are fast to answer to that. But then in the in the, in the process to do that, you limited or reduce the contents of the protection. And for me, this is important because, yeah, we can uh, send the message, but which kind of message but that, that are we are sending? That the unity in Europe is that when we have a face, something that is related to human rights, we prefer to, yeah, to be united and to send a message of unity and super fast than protect what it's in the in the constitutional uh, framework of the of the EU, so for me this is also part of this uh, of this problem. I understand perfectly that we know that they don't need there is no technical necessity from the uh, unanimity, but we have been living with the unanimity problem since uh, the very beginning of the times. And in any case, when the unanimity has break, uh, or with unanimity, when the countries has decided not to accomplish with the EU. Uh, council decisions, as in the case of the relocation, meaning we have the, uh, the fines that are going to be done at some point, but this is not helping the EU project in terms of sending messages related to what is the idea of fundamental rights and protection of rights in the, in the US scenario. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, John, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just I think I think all of these examples of discrimination, I think it's really important for us to document them as well as possible and really think about how they can be used for strategic litigation in in domestic courts and in the European Court of Human Rights. I, I mean, I think there's in a way there's there's all there's opportunities there, right? 
right? And because because what we already saw very starkly in terms of in terms of refugee rights being undermined is now even more stark and can can be hooked on to a discrimination claim, which probably has very solid grounds if we would think it through. Um, and, and, and I think a number of things, your, your presentation I think brings that up really well. And I think a number of things like what Yvonne mentioned earlier, I think really bring that out. And I think that that's a really important role that we could be playing as researchers that would also then feed into kind of advocacy and, and, and litigation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. I think it's really interesting that point because it's, uh, I, I have seen now more of the people uh, collecting experiences and discrimination situations at the, at the local and national level. Um, but yes, I think it could be really interesting to add uh, uh, some voices in that sense, in terms of uh, trying to support. Yeah, because at the end it's a national law, but the idea of similar situations happening uh, all the time with this kind of um, structural discrimination could be really interesting. Yes, absolutely. That would be a question also methodologically, you know, how we could approach that, that, that issue that we need to yeah, develop. So uh, uh, we have reached now the set limit for this uh, seminar. If you want to, we can continue the debate. If you have any more comments or questions also on issues that we perhaps have not um, brought up today, you're welcome to do that. But it's up to you if we're if this is going to last a little bit longer. Otherwise, we will yeah end. Uh, Henry, yes. Um, hi there. Thank you all for your reflections um, on this topic. I just had a a follow up question or a question that actually occurred to me just now. That's a bit off from some of the topics we've talked about. But it's that um, it seems to me that the Ukrainian state has um, abridged the right to leave one's own country for Ukrainian men from 18 to 60 years old. Now, of course, these are very exceptional circumstances under which this has happened in the context of an invasion. But still, I was wondering if anyone thinks that it's likely that there will be a response to this from the European Court of Human Rights or from other international bodies. Uh, anybody feels uh, qualified to answer that question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Vivian, yes. I think that uh, it's difficult in the European Court of Human Rights because the right to live is not an absolute right. And it's possible to limit this right for justified reasons. And if a country is um, suffering an aggression, so is suffering an aggression that is against uh, international law, I think that um, this country can uh, apply uh, exceptional measures. And for this reason, I think that it's difficult that this kind of, um, of, uh, of um, of um, applications uh, could have success before the European Court of Human Rights. It's different the case of Russian people that do not want to participate in the war, because in this case, they can be considered as refugees because of political reasons. It's the same in the, ca uh, in the cases that of people that deny to participate in the army that is compulsory for in, in, some, in some states. Uh, for uh, reasons related to their ideology, um, etc. But in the case of Ukrainian people, um, I see this difficult because uh, they are um, uh, Ukrainian government is is allowed to to take uh, exceptional measures in order to to defend sovereignty, the uh, statehood, etc. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Then perhaps with this uh, last intervention, we will conclude the meeting and uh, want to thank you all very much for your participation. I think it's been a really rich and stimulating debate and great presentations from all of you from different angles, I think quite complimentary.
So uh, we will continue the conversation in other forums. And yeah, say goodbye bye. now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.